Good morning, Gladwin Free Methodist Church. God is good. And all the time. Well, it's so good to see you here today. Uh, we have many amongst our church family who are either home ill uh, or on the road traveling because this is not only the beginning of Holy Week, but also the beginning of spring break. Uh, and so... Uh, we want to make sure that we keep all of our church family in our prayers for health and safety, uh, whether they be at home recovering or on the road traveling. Uh, and if you're tuning in uh, from the road or at home, uh, we miss you uh, and uh, know that uh, you are in our hearts and our minds and in our prayers. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and thankful for this time to be together in worship, to glorify your name. Lord, we know that, uh, that we have those who are normally here on Sunday mornings with us who are, who are sick or traveling, and we ask, Lord, that, uh, that they would uh, be made aware of your presence, that you would be made aware of you going before them, keeping them safe, uh, making them well. Uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, during this time of worship, that as we sing songs of praise to you, they would be an offering uh, from us, from our very hearts and souls, uh, up to you who sits on the throne. We pray, Lord, that uh, with the spoken words, whether they be in conversation or our message this morning or in Sunday school, Lord, that, uh, uh, that they would uh, be seeds planted within our very being, uh, that would be a part of your uh, recreation process within us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, confession time, church. Who here this morning has ever failed? Raise your hand if you've ever failed. Who here this morning is being dishonest? <laughs> if you didn't raise your hand. Anyway. We all have failed, right? That's a part of the, the human experience. It's a part of reality of, of life on this earth, for sure. Uh, and it's a lesson that we learn pretty young at age, too. As I was thinking about this, you know, I was thinking about the reality that, you know, I mean, if I say, if at first you don't succeed, what's the rest of it? Try, try again, right? We all know that to be true. And... We learn that at such a young age because, you know, many of us, most of us, one of the first things we do as a child is learn how to ride a bike. And I'm curious, how many of you have ever fallen off from a bike? And what do we do when we fall off of that bike? We get back on, right? Yeah, we get back on and, you know, and... Uh, most of us anyway, we don't say that's it, I'm never going to ride a bike again. We get back on and we keep going. And we're probably going to fall again and scrape our knee again and, and so on and so forth. I mean, I remember a season and it wasn't just from riding bikes, it was, it was playing the way that the little boys at least used to play anyway. Uh, where my mom told me, she's like, that's it, I'm not buying you any more jeans, you keep wrecking your jeans, you're going to go to school and going to go to church with patched up jeans. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever, I don't care. It really became a problem when the patches needed patched. So we know this to be true with things like riding a bike, but what do we do when we fail in life? Do we do the same thing? Do we, do we go, you know, kind of gather ourselves, rub some dirt in it, per se, and carry on with what we were trying to do and accomplish? Or do we give up on that thing? And a little bit more specifically, what do we do when we sin? Because sin is a failure, right? For the, uh, for the Christian, for the Christ follower... Uh, when we sin, when we fall short of uh, the standard that Jesus set from, for us, when we, uh, when we do something that's ungodly, that dishonors God, what do we do? And it gets a little bit more real and a little bit more tense when we think about that, right? 
Because sometimes when we sin, we say, well, I messed that up. I guess I might as well stay here doing this thing, right? Or stay here a little while longer doing this thing or thinking this way or acting this way. And that highlights the reality that it's not our failures that define us, but rather what we do with them. We can allow our failures to crush us, or we can surrender that failure, whether it's merely a failure or a sin, we can surrender that to God and allow Him to change us, to alter us. As we look a little bit more closely at that this morning, um, we're going to spend some time in First Chronicles. And for most of us, it's probably been a while since we were in First Chronicles. It is, oh, about a third of the way into your Bible uh, in the Old Testament. And it's right before Second Chronicles, uh, if that helps any, and right after Second Kings. Um, but as you're making your way there, I need to set some background for you. This tells the story, uh, a portion of King David's life. Uh, and it's a time when, when David was indeed king and had achieved quite a bit of success in conquering the land and establishing a kingdom. People weren't messing with the nation of Israel anymore. They weren't the new kid on the block that had to fight their way into getting credibility. They were the big dog, all right? Nobody was messing with Israel anymore. And so David had experienced much success in conquering the land and so then decided to take a census, counting up all the people uh, in the land they ruled. And there's nothing wrong with taking a census. The problem was he wasn't doing so, David wasn't doing so on God's authority. And in that day, taking a census was usually done right before going to war so that you knew the strength of your army, your fighting forces. Which, of course, would then lead the people, the kingdom, to assume that David was preparing for war. When instead, he was a bored king trying to inflate his ego. He wanted to know how great a nation of Israel had become because of his leadership and how great a leader he was. And even though his officials, his advisors, objected, David took the census, had the, the census taken anyway, and they reported the number to their king. And as soon as David heard the number of people, he came to a realization that he had screwed up, that he had messed up and failed. He knew that he had sinned against God. And as a consequence of this, a plague came over his people and 70,000 people in his kingdom were struck dead. This is the failure that sets up this account of David turning to God in a time of failure. So we're in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. I want to share with you verses, I think I'm going to start in 16, and we're going to go a while. What did I say? Yeah, 16 through 26. David lifted his eyes, saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, and in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth for mourning, fell upon their faces. And David said to God, What is it not I who gave command to number the people? It is I who have sinned and done great evil. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand, O Lord my God, be against me and against my father's house, but do not let the plague be on your people. Now the angel of the Lord had commanded Gad, who was David's wise man, advisor, 
to say to David that David should go up and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. He turned and saw the angel and his four sons who were with him hid themselves. As David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out from the threshing floor and paid homage to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, Give me the site of the threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to the Lord. Give it to me at its full price that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Ornan said to David, Take it and let my lord the king do what seems good to him. See, I give the oxen for burnt offerings and the threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for a grain offering. I give it all. But King David said to Ornan, No, I will buy them for the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David paid Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the site. And David built there an altar to the Lord and presented burnt offerings and peace offerings. Who called on the Lord, and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar of burnt offering. Just like David, we all fail. David, when he realized his sin, he cried out, I am in deep distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for His mercy is very great. But do not let me fall into human hands. David had the option of the consequences for his sin. And he chose to accept God's punishment because he knew that the Lord God is merciful, unlike people. We've experienced that too. Sometimes when we fail, sometimes when we sin, we face more than just the natural consequences to our action. Sometimes it's worse than a skinned knee or mom upset because she has to patch jeans. There are people who will hold that failure in our face. And they won't let us rise above it. Or they won't let us atone for our failure or our sin. There are those who will remind us of our failure until shame places a permanent mark on our hearts. In today's terms, we call that trauma. The cost of failure rings up at a different price for God than it does for men and women. I just think of, of Thomas even when I think of that. I mean, how often when you think of Thomas or refer to Thomas, do you just say Thomas versus calling him as he's well known 2,000 years later as Doubting Thomas. As people, we take and look at the worst event or the worst moment in one another's lives and too often allow that to inform how we see them or their identity. We see the alcoholic in a moment of intoxication. And not when he or she is going out of their way to help somebody on the side of the road with a flat tire or a broke down car. And we call him that no good drunk. We see our neighbor who is arguing with their husband or wife and we think, boy, they must be difficult to live with without knowing the whole story, and we allow that to inform our understanding of who they are. 
We see the person sitting in front of us, behind us, or across the aisle from us in church, and sometimes we think, what are they doing here, that hypocrite? I wonder if everybody else knows what they had been doing last week. The cost of failure is high amongst one another. And so consequently, we don't want to admit that we've fallen off our bike. Right? We don't want to admit that we have failed, that we have sinned. In fact, we won't show up to church with our skinned up knee or our patched up jeans. We do our best to clean that up and cover that up when we come in the door so that nobody knows. And we bury that inside. And each instance takes a bit away from us. Each instance destroys a bit of who God would have us to be. See, David could have been overwhelmed by the shame of his actions. He could have beaten himself up saying, you know what, I knew I would fail. What am I thinking? I knew I wasn't the leader these people needed. Why in the world did God choose me? You know what, that, that old guy that stopped by dad's house to anoint me as king, he was mistaken. I got to get out of here. He could have let others point their fingers at him and remind him of all the ways he screwed up in the past. And this was just one more mistake. But David knew that he could give the pain of his mistake to God and that in so doing, his relationship with God would be restored. And so in the face of failure, David placed himself in the hands of God. Likewise, as the Israelites several generations before were crossing the desert on their way to the promised land, God gave them instructions on how they could bring the sin of their past before him and receive forgiveness. The guilt offering, as this was called, was the last of the five offerings that, that God gave under the law and it was provided by God so people could make restitution for the sin they committed. This offering was meant as a means, as a way to make restoration for when a person sinned. But it also required restitution by paying over and above the price of sin. In Jesus' time here on earth, we remember that he, he met up with a tax keeper by the name of Zacchaeus. You know, the wee little man. The wee little man was he that Zacchaeus and tax collectors in that day were, were disliked even more than the IRS is today because tax collectors had their percentage that they had to pay into the government but anything above and beyond that amount that they collected was theirs they worked on commission of sorts and so Zacchaeus after spending an evening with Jesus, realized the sin that he had done and overcharging people for their taxes. He went out. And as the story reads, it's almost like while Jesus was sleeping, he went out and paid back what he took from the people and then also paid them more for restitution for his sin. Thankfully for you and I, people who will admittedly raise our hand and say, yep, I failed, I have sinned. God's word is filled with the story of those who have sinned. 
This week being Holy Week, one of the, one of the people we think about is, is Peter. The last night of Jesus' life here on earth, Peter promised to stay with Jesus and go with him, whether to prison or to death. But in a few hours' time, denied Jesus three times. Just like we have done ourselves. How can we face the Lord when we have failed, not once, but time after time after time? What do we do with that failure? Often we beat ourselves up. Usually we try to hide it so that no one can berate us for it. But Jesus invites us to face our sin and lay it at the cross. See, failure isn't always bad. It's transformative. It can turn us towards God so that we humble ourselves and lift Him up in His power. Many of the Psalms refer to failure by no coincidence written by King David. Psalm 73, 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 145, 14 says, The Lord upholds all who are failing and raises up all who are bowed down. Paul wrote of his own failures, which God used to teach him and continues to use to teach others. But Paul wrote in Romans, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. See, this chain, our failure, our sin, leads to suffering, right? And suffering... Uh, as we lean into God, produces endurance, and endurance builds character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. And so when we let God work in the midst of our failures and in the midst of our sin, we do away with shame we do away with trauma, allowing us to live healthier, holier lives. To the Corinthian church, Paul wrote, quoting Jesus initially, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So what is our next step when we fail? What do we do when there's that thing that we are ashamed of that almost paralyzes us, that consumes us? If we follow the example of, of David and we follow the example of Peter and Paul, we seek out God. We create a space to encounter our merciful Father. Because He will use our failures to transform us. The truth is, we've all failed, right? I mean, you acknowledged it. 
Yet in response, we must face our failure, face our sin, and place it at the feet of Jesus as our offering. The Lord offers forgiveness to all. There's no limit to that. The question is, are we willing to receive it? Because there's still a cost. You fall off the bike, you're still going to scrape your knee or hit your head. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 states, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. See, our forgiveness, the forgiveness that that God has made a way for us had a cost to Him, the ultimate cost, through the life, the death of His only Son. But it also has a cost for us. There's still consequences, right, to our sin. David desired to create a space to encounter God when he realized his sin, this failure. He wanted to build an altar. And at that altar, David could offer a sacrifice to the Lord as repentance. And so when he approached Ornan, ready to buy the threshing floor uh, for the space to build the altar, Ornan was willing to give it to him at no cost. I mean, can you imagine President of the United States, don't insert a name or this analogy goes weird. President of the United States shows up at your house and says, I need to make a space to pray for repentance. And I want to do so in your garage or your pole barn. I'm going to have to knock it down. And it's going to have to stay that way. I, most of us, anyway, I think would feel some sense of, of, of honor, some sense of weird humility, uh, some sense of rejoicing that hey, the president wants to repent and pray to God. Of course, I'm going to let him knock down my garage or my barn. It's about time. I mean, I'd rather be the neighbors, but hallelujah. You know, come on. And so I'm sure Ornan had this, this mindset of wanting to honor David, but also rejoicing that this was going to be a holy thing. And so, offered this up for free, you know. King David, I'm so honored, and I'm so glad that you're turning to God. Here, have the threshing floor. And you know what? Uh, obviously, I'm not going to be using the, 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 the threshing machine in there anymore. Take the wood from that and use that for the fire. And uh, take those oxen too. It's all yours. But David knew, David knew that there's a cost to sin and there's a cost to following and honoring God and that he had to pay the price. It couldn't be paid by Ornan on his behalf. And David insisted on paying the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. For David to be transformed by God's grace, he had to accept the cost. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his great book, Cost of Discipleship, he makes it clear and says, grace is free but not cheap. Grace is free but not cheap. The grace of God is unearned and unearnable, but if we ever expect to grow in grace, 
We must pay the price of a consciously chosen course of action, which involves both individual and group life. There's a lot there. There's a tremendous price to grace in Jesus Christ, but there's a tremendous price to grace as we step in, as we lean in as well. And if we want to grow, we have to pay the price by taking an intentional course of action. And it doesn't work with just individual life. It requires group life as well. Boy, a month ago now, maybe a little bit longer, many of, of our, um, our board members, our trustees, and our worship planning team uh, went through a book called The Other Half of Church, uh, and we gathered together for uh, an evening and then the better part of the following day uh, to work through some of the stuff in the book. And one of the, one of the dynamics this book talks about is the reality of shame and how... For the most part, most of our lives, all we have experienced is toxic shame that makes us feel bad and less than in a way that creates this, this scar, this, this trauma in our lives that causes us to bury this thing, this failure, this sin, this event in our lives. But instead, in a healthy group dynamic, in a healthy church, and here's an opportunity, church, for us to grow and further develop our relational soil. In a healthy dynamic, we acknowledge that when we sin against one another and against God, we acknowledge that we've done so, we seek repentance, and we correct one another kindly. What does that look like? Well, there are certain things that we do as followers of Christ, and there are certain things that we don't do. And if I forget for a moment my identity as a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm acting like a knucklehead, that means that Austin is my brother, or really any of you, not only have permission to, but have an obligation to talk to me. Say, Steve, you know, this is a face-to-face -face conversation. This is not text, people, please. It's face-to-face -face conversation. Steve, you've forgotten who you are as a child of God. And you're acting like a knucklehead. He calls you to be honest and kind and whatever, you know, whatever the situation is. That's who we are as followers of Christ. Am I going to feel shame in that moment? Yeah, I am. I'm going to be ashamed of my actions, as I ought to be. But it's not something that I'm going to bury, right? Because I feel so loved that you care enough to remind me of who I am in Christ and to have that conversation with me. That's part of group life as church. That's part of the cost of grace. We fail. We sin. But one of the roles, biblical roles and responsibilities and purposes of church is to build one another up in Jesus Christ. Not to beat one another down or look the other way. And so we correct one another kindly. Remember that outline, please. You've forgotten who you are in Jesus Christ. Because I love you, I'm going to remind you 
that as a follower of Jesus, we are people who are honest. We are people who are caring, again, whatever fits the situation. David came to this realization because he had people around him who would tell him the truth. And he knew that he had sinned. And he dealt with it. He took it to God. We have to be willing to accept a life of discipleship like David. Not one where we run and hide, where we keep a closet full of the things that we don't want anyone to know about, where we bury those away, where we leave our patched up jeans at home and cover everything up so that we're not hurt, so that we're looking spiffy spiritually when we walk in the door on Sunday morning. A life of discipleship where we can't wait to come together because, you know what, I screwed up and I can't be whole until I'm with my people who remind me who I am and I come to my God and my Savior Jesus Christ and give this failure, this sin over to Him. This is Holy Week. This week, more than ever, most of us, most of this country, will at some point be reflecting on Jesus' days on earth before He paid the ultimate price for you and me. This week, will you allow the sacrifice of Jesus to change you so that your altar transformed to look more and more like Him, the one who died for us? We're going to sing a song, I Speak Jesus. And I want this to be your prayer over one another. I want you to this to be your prayer over the empty spots, the people that God has in mind to fill the empty spots in our sanctuary. I want you to know that the altar is open for prayer. If you've got business to take care of, to give over this sin, this failure in your life to God, this thing that you've buried, don't leave here today without doing that. Can we sing together? You know, there's a few things that that song names that we speak Jesus over. So I'm going to ask if, if, if we can have the humility and the boldness that if addiction has touched your life or your home, will you stand up this morning? If depression, anxiety have touched your house, your home, your life, will you stand up this morning? If the enemy has placed strongholds in your life, will you stand up this morning? I want you to look around, not to take notes, but to know that you are not alone. This is most of the church here today is standing. And we speak Jesus over those situations. And I want to pray with you this morning. Um, so we just turn to Him and His power. Almighty God, we cannot think of You without thinking of the amazing gift of Your Son, Jesus Christ, and His death on the cross, His resurrection, and the Holy Spirit within us who follow Him. And Lord, we know that there's no limit to His power. There's no limit to the sin that He paid the price for. And so Lord, this morning as we think about the, the darkness of 
of addiction that has touched so many homes and families and individuals in our church and in our community, Lord. We speak Jesus over those situations. We claim Your power. And we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit through Your church and out into this community to shine Your light and share Your truth. Lord, the realities of depression and anxiety and how crippling they can be, Lord. We turn to you. Knowing that there is nothing that can bring the peace and the comfort that you offer, that you grant us. And Father, the strongholds that afflict so many of us. Lord, we speak, Jesus, knowing that that victory has already been won. And as we close this time of worship, may we walk out of here not with a spirit of defeat, but a spirit of victory because of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in His name we pray. Amen.